Welcome back to the course Airline Planning and Optimization. In this lecture, we'll discuss how to develop an airline schedule. We'll use the fleet assignment model through this lecture to help us to solve both the timetable design problem and the fleet assignment problem itself. We will once more divide our lecture into three parts. In the first part, we'll introduce the fleet assignment problem followed by the formulation of the respective model. Before this, we'll discuss in short the multiple phases of the schedule development process. In a second video lecture, we will briefly study how we can use this fleet assignment model to solve the itinerary based fleet assignment problem. This is a problem in which we combine the fleet assignment model with the passenger mixed flow model that we have studied in the previous lecture. The final video of this lecture gets back to the timetable design problem, which is the first step of the schedule development process and, therefore, solved before the fleet assignment problem in practice. Once more, we're going to use the fleet assignment model to help us to solve the timetable design problem. In terms of the program, we are covering the fleet assignment problem and we'll integrate it with the passenger mix flow problem. As before, we'll use mixed integer linear programming models to solve the problems described in this lecture. But before we move into the content, let's check where we are in terms of our planning framework. We have already discussed the strategic problems, namely the fleet planning and the network development problems. We got from these two problems a good idea of our frequency planning and the fleet allocation per route. But we are getting into the tactical scaling planning stage, and it's time to exactly define our timetable and to allocate a fleet type to each flight in our network so that we do know the capacity available in each flight, in order to sell seats in our revenue management process. So let's start with the fleet assignment problem, but before we're going to have an overview of what is the scheduling development uh, process. So the overall problem, the scheduling development problem, consists in defining our timetable and allocating resources to our flights, giving our network, fleet and pool of crew members. The process is developed in four interrelated and sequential tasks, being the timetable design, which includes the definition of the times we will operate each one of our flights, the fleet assignment that allocates the aircraft types to each one of these flights. These two problems, the timetable design and the fleet assignment, will be discussed in this lecture, and the two other problems we'll discuss in the coming lectures. The first one is the crew scaling problem, which defines which crew members, cabin and cockpit will operate each flight. And this is followed by the aircraft rotation problem that allocates specific aircraft, so tail numbers, to each flight in our timetable, in such a way that we can produce continuous routes for each aircraft, covering all flights in our timetable and respecting maintenance constraints. These four steps are solved at different times. The entire process starts for most airlines more than one year before operations. So after the definition of the fleet plans, done at least a couple of years before operations, and after defining our network, which should be closed more or less one year before operations, we are ready to start developing our schedule. We start by defining the timetable one year before operations. This has to be ready to initiate the revenue management process, so to start selling tickets. Ideally, at this time, we already have a good idea of the capacity that we're going to have available for each flight. But this capacity should be defined a few months before operations, because then we need to know the exact number of seats that we have available to sell in each flight. Closer to operations, let's say one to two months before it, we should define the crew schedule, providing information to all crews on their rosters for the coming weeks. This is because crews have to organize their lives, so we have to provide this information in advance. Aircraft, on the other hand, do not complain about not knowing their future, so we can postpone our decisions to just one or two uh, weeks before operations. But the true reason of doing this later is that the aircraft rotation problem is linked with the maintenance planning, and we would like to delay our decisions to accommodate maintenance requirements and define routes that allow us to schedule our maintenance. The developed full schedule, after ready, is always subject to final revisions and adjustments to cope with disruptions or irregular operations. For instance, a maintenance requirement that just come two or three days before operations, or crew calling heel just the day before a flight. But even during the day of operations, until the flight departures, there are always cases that can force us to adjust the scale. This takes place 
at the operational or control phase of the planning framework. Okay, although the timetable design problem comes first, let's first have a look at the fleet assignment problem. This inverted sequence will hopefully make sense to you in the end of this lecture. In short, the timetable design is a problem that is rarely solved from scratch, and when we solve it partially, the fleet assignment model is a possible solution approach. So let's look first into this fleet assignment problem. The goal of this problem is to minimize our operating costs by allocating the most convenient aircraft to each flight, or eventually to maximize profits by both reducing costs and allocating more capacity to the flights that can generate more revenue. Another approach commonly used in literature is to minimize the costs associated with spillage. Regardless what is the objective function, we have to limit our solution to the fleet we do have available and the demand per each flight in our timetable. We have to guarantee that we do have an aircraft type allocated to each flight in our solution. The solution we're going to obtain is the allocation of an aircraft type to each flight in our timetable. This is one of the airline problems that, in practice, is largely addressed using mathematical models. This is, in fact, the case for most of the scaling problems that we're going to discuss in these and in the coming lectures. But this is not a trivial problem to solve. How can we tackle it? And first, how can we represent it in a good way that allows us to compute a solution to our problem that is feasible? I'll use here an example provided in the Global Airline Industry book from Bellobaba et al, displayed in this slide. We do have three airports, Chicago, La Guardia, New York, and Boston. And we do have a fleet of five aircraft of three types with the number of seats and costs per aircraft type summarized in the table on the right. We do have 10 flights, and we can see in this table the fare and estimated demand per flight. So the goal is to assign these aircraft types to each flight in our schedule, so we know the capacity that we'll allocate to each of these flights. Let's say we want to maximize profit. How can we determine the optimal fleet assignment? What will be your approach? I presume that some of you have suggested the greedy approach, in which we check for each flight what is the most profitable aircraft and we allocate that aircraft to that flight. If we do that by computing a matrix of the profit per aircraft type versus flight, we can easily make our selections. And we'll end up with five flights allocated to our A300 uh, aircraft and four flights allocated to the Boeing 737 fleet. Only one flight will be allocated to the DC-9, since it is an old and less efficient aircraft. Ok, we do have a solution, but is this a good solution? Is this a feasible solution? What, what is the problem with this solution? Let's see, the most obvious one is that the DC-10 has a single flight, so every day the aircraft will be positioned in the wrong airport. Furthermore, we also have problems with our A300 fleet. The flight from Boston that departs at 11.30 departs before a first flight arrives with an A300 at the same airport, forcing us to locate one aircraft in Boston every night. In fact, if we check the fleet allocation to cover all flights covered by the A300 fleet, we'll need to have at least three aircraft of this type while we only have two in our initial fleet. For the Boeing 737, we do have two flights from Boston to La Guardia, but there is no Boeing 37, but there is no Boeing 737 arriving in Boston. And the Chicago to La Guardia flights also do have times that do not guarantee a circular route of a single aircraft. So how to avoid this mess? There is a feasible solution to this problem provided in the book. So how can we get to this solution? So perhaps we have to change our approach. The approach to follow is to capture the nature of this problem by representing it via a network. In particular, we will represent our aircraft allocation possibilities over time and space in what we call a time-space network. In each row, we represent an airport, the space perspective, and in the x-axis, we represent time from left to right, it could be the other way around, where we have airports in the columns, which would be the same thing. The network is represented by nodes and three types of arcs. 
There are the flight arcs that represent the flights that we have to ha cover in our timetable. They connect to airports. So they start at an airport and end at another airport. And they are diagonal because they represent the flights that go over time. At the start and the end of each one of these arcs, we do have a node. These nodes are the elements in our model that allow the change of allocation of an aircraft, eventually from a flight arc to a ground arc and vice versa. Speaking about the ground arcs, these are the second set of arcs. They represent the possibility of an aircraft to stay on the ground over time at a given airport. If we look at each airport, there is a unique ground arc connecting each sequential node created at that airport in our time-space network. The final set of arcs is a special set of ground arcs, sometimes called overnight arcs, that guarantee that there is a continuity between the aircraft that we do have at each airport at the end and at the start of our scheduling horizon, so we can start again the cycles. Be aware that we'll end up having a different network for each aircraft type. First, because eventually they have different crew speeds, so the flight durations will be different. In addition, in these networks, as we're going to see, we want to have our end node representing when the aircraft is available. So we'll add to the flight time, the turnaround time of each aircraft. These turnaround times are dependent on the aircraft type that we are modeling. Finally, you may also want to remove the flight arcs from the network of a specific aircraft type if you know in advance that that flight cannot be covered by that aircraft type for instance due to its range constraints or airport limitations. It is important to notice that the time-space network is different than a static network. Eventually, it's an extension of the static network. In the static network, we have a representation of a schedule, a solution to our fleet assignment problem. With the time-space network, we do not want to represent a solution. We want to model the possible schedule alternatives. It is a representation model, not a solution. In the figure here, you can see the solution to the previous problem, as represented in the book Global Airline Industry. This is a static representation, with the allocations already defined. In the case of the time-space network, we use the representation to formulate our MLP problem. And, if you want to imagine it such, is a model that allows our set of aircraft to navigate through the network, using arcs and the nodes to transfer between arcs. So let's try to see how we can represent and formulate our fleet assignment problem using a time-space network to solve a simple example. Let's go back to our Atlantic Airlines example that we used to discuss our network and fleet development models. We have now the situation of having four A310s and another four A320s in our fleet. The details of this aircraft are provided in the next slide. In the next slide, we'll also have the schedule of the 18 flights that the airline is operating between the Portuguese mainland airports, Funchal, Ponta Delgada, the hub airport, and the two airports in the North America, Boston and Toronto. The goal is to define the best fleet allocation to guarantee that we do operate all the 18 flights and we minimize our costs with the fleet that we have available. As mentioned, in this slide we see the tables that provide us information about the flights and the aircraft types. We assume that the schedule is the same every day. We can observe that all flights are either to or from the hub, Ponta Delgada, and that the A310 is a larger aircraft with more seats and longer range, but it is also less efficient, it is an older aircraft. It has a higher cost per ISK and has also a longer turnaround time. But how are we going to represent our time-space network to solve this problem? Let's focus on two simple airports with just a few flights. The airport of Porto and the airport of Toronto. We're going to represent this for our A310 fleet, but a similar process will have to be followed for the A320 and eventually for the other airports in our network. First, airport of Porto. So we do have the first flight arriving at Porto at 11.45 coming from PDL, Ponta Delgada. We're going to represent the arrival node at the flight schedule arrival time plus the turnaround time of our aircraft. So that is 11.45 plus 30 minutes of uh, turnaround time from the A310. So our node represents the time that the aircraft is ready for the next flight, and that will be at 12.25. We represent all the other flight arcs from Porto, so a departed flight to PDL at 
another departure flight to PDL at 7.05, and an arrival flight from PDL that arrives at 9.10, but will have this 40 minutes of turnaround, so our ready time will be at 9.50. Note that all these flights will have an equivalent node being represented in the PDL airport, but we are not showing here. So the following step is to connect all the consecutive nodes with a ground arc. Note that we should guarantee that there is only one aircraft type being allocated to each flight arc, but we can have more than one aircraft at the same time in each ground arc, because more than one aircraft can be at the same time in the same airport. We do the same thing for the Toronto airport, starting with the first flight that is also an arrival flight that we represent the ready time at the scheduled arrival time plus a turnaround time, and we do have an outbound flight at 2.45 in the night. Between these two nodes we have a ground arc. The final step is to define our overnight arcs that guarantee the continuity of the schedule from one day to the other having always the same number of aircraft staying at the nights in each airport according to the schedule needs. Imagine that we have done the same process to all the other airports in our network and we'll have our time space network for the A310 fleet. We have to do the same process to the A320 and we'll work with two time space networks. We can now start modeling our problem following an AMLP formulation. For this, we need first to define what we want from our model. We know that our problem is a cost minimization problem, so that's our objective function. In terms of constraints, we also know that we have to cover every single flight in our timetable, with one aircraft type and only one. That is, our flight arcs have to be selected either in the time-space network of the A310s or in the time-space network of the A320s. To guarantee that we do have a continuity in our network, that our aircraft will flow from arc to arc without having any aircraft disappearing or appearing in any part of our network, we have to make sure that at each node in our both networks that there is a continuity of aircraft flows, that is, that the number of aircraft getting in that node is equal to the number of aircraft getting out that node. The third set of constraints we refer to the limitation of the number of aircraft that we do have in our fleet. We have to guarantee that we won't be using more aircraft in our networks as the number of aircraft that we do have from each aircraft type. We can then have other constraints related, uh, for example, to maintenance needs, range constraints, airport limitations, like the number of airport slots available that may limit the number of aircraft on the ground at the same time, etc. I would like to go back to constraints 3. How are we going to check the number of aircraft that we are using in our network? If you see again our time-space network as a whole, and see again our model as a network in which our aircraft will flow in a continuous way in time and space, it is easy to understand that the number of aircraft in the arcs crossing cuts 1, 2, 3 or 4 has to be exactly the same. That is, if we go to cut 2 and we sum the number of aircraft in our solution in all the arcs which are crossed with this cut, the result is the number of aircraft that we are using from the fleet being modeled. The same number should be obtained if we do the same thing for cut 3 or cut 4 or 1. So in our model we need to model this by looking at one of these cuts and checking the number of aircraft that are crossing that cut. Ok, moving on to our fleet assignment model. Let's start with the notations. Besides the set of airports, the set of aircraft types and the set of flights, we need to have the set of ground arcs, which are different for each one of our aircraft types, and the set of arcs that intercept our time cut, discussed in the previous slide. We can choose one of the cuts and include all arcs intercepted as being part of the set. We still need four other set of sets to model our node balance constraints. So we have to know all flight arcs and ground arcs getting in and out each node in all our time-space networks. The pre-processing of the airline timetable and the generation of these four last sets is the most demanding step when building our fleet allocation model, and it is what defines our time-space networks. Moving on, we have two types of decision variables. FIK, which are the binary variables that tell us if the flight arc I was assigned to the aircraft type K, and YAK, that refers to allocation of an aircraft K to the ground arc A. Because we can have more than one aircraft using each ground arc, 
These last variables are integer and not necessarily binary. Finally, we do have parameters that refer to the characteristics of the aircraft, the cost, distance and demand per flight in our timetable. Finally, let's formulate our problem. Our objective function is the minimization of the cost, summing the cost of all combination of flights and aircraft type and multiplying these with our binary variable that tells us if that flight is allocated or not to that specific flight type. Constraints C1 are the ones that guarantee that all flights are covered by one and only one aircraft type. So we sum our FI case for a specific flight I and make sure that this is equal to one. The constraints too we'll analyze in the next slide, but these are the balance constraints that guarantee that the number of aircraft getting out of each node is equal to the number of aircraft getting in that same node. Constraints 3 refer to the maximum number of aircraft in the fleet of each type. We're going to sum the values of our decision variables in the set of arcs that cross that cut. In this model, we are not considering ground arc costs, but in some cases, this can be needed and added to the objective function, representing airport landing fees or parking fees that apply differently to different aircraft types. In some cases, we may also consider the case that our constraints C1 are not an equality, but are less or equal to 1. But when this will be the case? Can you think about it? A case where we'll want to have this less or equal to 1? And will this work with the current objective function? I'll let you think about this. As promised, let's see how constraints C2 work. So let's consider a given aircraft type K and a specific node I in this time-space network represented in this small figure that we do have in our slide. So our expression has four terms in the left-hand side, or four sets. So from left to right, we do have the set of ground arcs leaving the node in dark orange in the figure, the set of flight arcs leaving the node in blue, the set of ground arcs getting into the node in light orange, and the set of flight arcs arriving at the node in green. We always have a single ground arc getting in and out the node, but eventually you may have more than one flight arcs getting either in or out our node. Looking at this color scheme, we can understand how our constraints will work. So we have to sum the number of aircraft getting out that node via a ground arc and via flight arcs, and we have to deduct to these the number of aircraft arriving at that node via a ground arc and via flight arcs. And this sum has to be equal to zero to guarantee the balance. Okay, if we use our model to solve our Atlantic Airlines problem, we can obtain two solutions. One in which we do not limit our fleet, so we relax our constraint C3, and another one in which we impose the fleet to be as defined in our problem, so four A310s and four A320s. For the first case, we can see that most of our flights will be operated by the A320 fleet. Only the four flights that have a length longer than the range of the A320 aircraft are indeed allocated to the expensive A310 aircraft. This A310 aircraft will be on the ground at the North American airports at the beginning of each day of operations, ready to departure in the overnight flight from both airports to PDL. If we limit our solution to the fleet given in our problem, our objective function value increases by 56,000 euros. Our fleet A310 has now to operate more flights than the ones from the previous solution, because the four A320 aircraft will not be enough to operate the remaining flights. We now will have two A310s located at PDL at the beginning of each day. I hope that this video gave you a good overview of the fleet assignment problem and the model we can use to solve this problem. In the next videos, we see how we can use this same model to solve related problems. So I'll see you there. Bye bye.